They were the heroes from the future. Teenagers protecting the universe from those that would sow the seeds of chaos. Each had unique powers and abilities. And though they often had their differences, they came together to save the day as the Legion of Superheroes. Now you can be a part of their adventures and learn the history of the future in the Legion Clubhouse. This week on the Legion Clubhouse, what's up with Quizlet? Why is he so weird? Legion of Superheroes, Volume 3, Number 20. Published March 1986. To Control a World. Written by Paul Levitz with art by Greg LaRoque and Larry Malstead. Synopsis. Welcome to the murder world of Tear. And Night of Madness. Written by Paul Levitz with art by Keith Giffen and Mike DiCarlo. Synopsis. Halloween hijinks led to serious consequences in the 30th century. Before we answer the question that is on everyone's lips, Matthew, Mm -hmm. we need to deal with the death world of tear. Tear, 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 tear. To control, control. I think if Star Wars taught us anything, Mm -hmm. is that the only way to stop a planet is to blow it up. In fact, I think that was kind of the premise in uh, a Star Trek episode, uh, the Corbinite maneuver, right? Where uh, you had that thing that was a planet destroyer, basically a sun eater. You got to blow it up, right? That's the ultimate weapon. Yeah, the ultimate weapon. Yeah. Uh, You got to blow it up. Uh, And of course, you know, blowing up a planet, Matthew, Mm -hmm. that's bad. Yes. Never. However, 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 Blowing up a sun eater, good. Right. Because sun eaters eat suns and thus blow up planets by extension. But I thought the Legion was in favor of saving all lives. <sighs> you know, the devil has plenty of advocates, Stephen. I, I, I know he does. <laughs> that's, why it's, that's why it's so interesting that when the Legion uh, bring out their hypocrisy, Every issue, we need to call it out. I don't know that it's a hypocrisy in this case. I think it really is. It's more complicated than that. It's it's the question of, if we know that potentially Tiraz and its uh, wacky, crazy cyborg dudes could kill millions in the UP, is it justified to kill those millions of Tirazians or Tirazanites? To save the potential lives of billions more. It's the trolley problem. Right, right. And, and, that's, and that's the thing, right? I mean, the, uh, the controller has come in and he's like, no, these guys are killing, killing people. These, these guys are destroying planets and killing everything in its wake. So there's not a question of, eh, might these guys kill a bunch of people? May they not kill a bunch of people? Let's find out kind of thing. It's like, no, these guys are definitely going to do the exact same thing to Earth that the sun eater was going to do to the sun. I think that the controller in this case, while he does, he does bring up important points and I feel like he's an important foil for the Legion here. Yep. His perspective has to be carefully weighed. Uh, I mean, element lad calls him on it. He actually comes out and says, you misunderstand the meaning of the word control. But I feel like the controller brings up an important point, but the controller is also coming from the perspective of someone who has already decided to murder a world and is now trying to convince the Legion to follow through with the murder of a world that he can now not do because they did something to take away the weapon. Because they killed killed his weapon, so he wants them to destroy the other weapon. Right, they now have to become the new weapon, whereas the Legionnaires, especially Element Lad, who comes from a planet that was decimated by pirates just because, you know, they wanted to be rich and they wanted yeah. to be the only ones who could be rich. Yeah. The the Legion is not willing to kill Tiraz summarily without trying to explore other options. And I feel like that... On the, on the one hand, it is you know Bronze Age comics. It's 1986, and things are things are still very Reagan era, and there's very much an expectation here that the controller is wrong. 
I mean, the comic, the comic book industry in this, in this point will bring up these questions, but there's no question that the Legionnaire's stance of we're not going to kill them is considered to be the correct one. So it's not something that's actually portrayed as a real choice for the Legionnaire's. Moreover, it's 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 kind of a thing where yeah, they're Ellen they're presumed is now having to figure out how to not kill. Yeah, these no, people. they're they're but, presumed to be in the um, uh, what's the other Star Trek thing where you're uh, you're put in the situation that you can't win, but but right, Kirk figures out a way to win. Right, he's, he's it's a Kobayashi Maru. Yeah, the Kobayashi and, Maru. That's kind of what these guys are put in because they know what the prime objective is, which is you know don't right. take a life. But they also know that eh, we kind of took a life when we killed that Sun Eater. Uh, so we're really dealing in shades of gray. But we're going to sweep that under the cover because we know the Tyrians or the Taraxians are red guys. And red equates to Russia and Russia bad. <laughs> and so we have to figure well, out a different way to stop them without blowing them up real good. You do make a valid point when you say they are red guys, because not only are they literally red, which is the color of aggression, uh, especially in 1986, not only are they all dressed like a uh, disco bondage, Mr. T as uh, you know, seen in the movie Zardoz, there are no unarmed. Yeah, Terrazians. That's, that's the other thing that I was going to no, bring up. There are no women or children. Terrazians. They are well, that all we see. warrior guys. Right. right. So that's no, that's the other part of the depending on which way your argument would have gone, I would have brought up that, you know, we don't see any quote unquote innocent people on Tyrax, right. right? We only see the quote unquote bad guys. We don't see the fact that if they did blow up this planet and they were killing quote unquote innocent women and children, then yeah, I could see right. that they have that. But unfortunately, we are only presented, as you said with a warrior army, un not unlike the Kund. Yes. Very, and they actually uh, name-check the Kund as well when, when Tiraz is moving in. They're like, well, if the UP can hold off, if the fleet can hold off the Kund, they can probably deal with Tiraz if we can find a way to keep them from invading other planet space. But I don't know if the only showing... Uh, warriors who look an awful lot like Tyr, their leader. I mean, they, they could be men and women, just like dwarf right. women have beards. Sure. But I, I, I'm not sure if, you know, based on this era, if that is a conscious decision on the part of Levitz and Larocque. Oh, only to have them as men? Um, right. Or if it's just what, if, if it's like a Star Trek Planet of the Hats question, because science fiction writers are bad with scale and the legionnaires who are fighting this planet sized mass are occasionally in that, that first wide shot of Tiraz, you can kind of see tiny little dots that may supposedly represent our legionnaires. Yeah. But they shouldn't. Right. Because the, even, even the tiny, tiny scale that we get here, the yeah. legionnaires should not be visible at all. So um, the question of how many people are on planet Tiraz yeah. Uh, well, we see 20 or 30 of them, and that's probably how many there are. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned uh, women being in the military. 1917, Loretta Walsh became the first woman to enlist openly as a woman. Uh, 1948 law made women a permanent part of the military service. Now, that would be like your wax um, right. kind of stuff that's, you know, doing a lot of things that were not frontline stuff. Uh, 1976, right. the first group of women were admitted into a U.S. military academy. So... Women are a part of the military at this point, but, you know, I, I guess from this cursory look, I don't see when U.S. women, and again, uh, yes, I realize that, you know, there's other countries, uh, China, Israel, et cetera, there where, are. Yes, um, where women are put on frontline uh, situations. Uh, but I would like to know when the U.S. put women on the front line, um, you know, as far as a year. Um, and only because if you're talking about, you know, comic book uh, creators may not be as well informed about the greater, the greater world that may play a part in why we only see the men in here, especially in the 1980s when it very much was men join the military. Have you seen this movie? Top Gun, come fly and kill commies. Kind of stuff. 
up to the risky. Um, yeah, yeah, so, you know, I'm sure our listeners are sitting here going, man, these guys sure going on and on and on about uh, this discussion of should we kill or should we not kill? And that's kind of the feeling I got when I read this issue, right? It's Me like, too. It, can we just continue this Star Trek discussion? <laughs> it's interesting. And the justifications behind it and, you know, the various people weighing in the controller being like control means control beep burp and element lad going no my mommy is turned into a rock now but it does go on a little bit longer than i like especially since we got four issues of this not that long ago yeah in the same context dealing with tiraz and this controller Mm -hmm. i do like uh, the fight sequences, I think, are really well drawn. Uh, Gary, uh, uh, Greg LaRoque uh, and Larry Molstead are, are doing the art duties on on this one. And there's some great, great poses, great action going on mm-hmm. here, I think, that works uh, really, really well. I think one problem that I see with LaRoque, and it's one I think I've seen him, and and going forward, we will see many other artists also kind of commit this sin, is what do we do when our characters are not fighting Mm -hmm. and they just have to kind of stand around and they're not yelling at one another. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes the women are drawn in these really weird, insecure, standing around, uh, sexily squeezing my boobs together kind of pose. And that is not something that's just something that is, uh, that, uh, uh, no, that's not a Greg thing. That's yeah, no, this is something that I noticed with him, especially that we're on the page where we get to see, a uh, chameleon boy's incredibly tight butt. <laughs> um, but hey, we also, you know, if you could, we also get shape, to see Phantom Girl. Yeah. When you see Phantom Girl standing around like that, suddenly I'm like, oh no, this whole thing where there's some imaginary wind blowing her hair and women stand around like this is a thing that I start to notice in the 80s a lot. And I don't know if that is because of reference photos and where the reference photos may or may not be coming from, but it is something mm-hmm. that people just standing around doing nothing. Uh, Even if you go a few pages later with uh, uh, who is it? Uh, Shadow Lass, uh, where Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lightning Lass and Shadow Lass are having a a, a conversation that her Mm -hmm. hair is just like blowing for no reason. It's like, it's not the style is literally blowing in some imaginary wind. With Phantom Girl, uh, obviously she is semi, uh, she's semi uh, solid. So, the winds of Bug Tussle, her uh, secondary yeah, home, don't buy it. are blowing her hair. Bug Tussle and winds are notoriously powerful. Mm-hmm. But, you know, speaking of Lightning Lass, mm-hmm. I feel like Lightning Lass gets handed the jerk ball in that sequence because they're talking about Brainiac. Shadow yeah. Lass is worried because she wonders what Brainy is up to. And Lightning Lass is like, well, I think he's just a little nuts. He won't catch me wearing him. And I'm like, you know, you you got a lot of damn ball making fun of him, given who your big brother is. I mean, that's well, very that's why, that's why she, uh, I don't think she's being cowardly. I literally think she's speaking uh, speaking truth to, you know, to the, to the world. And uh, I think people are just like, extremely she's extremely callous and thoughtless and, just very cruel to someone who is a very long-term friend. And again, you'd think that growing up with mental illness in the form of her brother, Mac might make her at least a little bit, you know, sensitive, but it looks like it's had the opposite effect on her. Like, she's just like, Oh, well, green guy is, I don't know. Uh, I think she's, I think she's just calling it out and, you know, where everyone else is like, Oh, maybe, you know, he's having some problems dealing with, Maybe he's having some projection problems uh, with dealing with, uh, you know, this sensor girl and the loss of Supergirl, um, you know, and she's like, no, I think he I think he has some serious mental illness. Uh, and again, w- today we would say mental illness. Uh, she, you know, in, in the 80s, it's it's very casual to say, oh, no, he's nuts or he's crazy or cuckoo or crazy in the right. cabeza. You know, all of those things uh, would would be OK in the 1980s. Uh, so I think it I wonder if it's not just the word usage that makes it feel maybe a little bit more callous than it, it may. Uh, be her facial at. expression in that middle panel is just like, whatever, this guy's an idiot. This I, I guy think is, I think is, all is, of their expressions are that way. I mean, to an extent, I, I, it feels very, it feels out of character for yeah. Ayla, especially, right. you know, Ayla, 
or in the in the volume four. But right. you know, the people who are normally mean like this, your wildfires, your dawn stars, your shrinking violets, they're not here. So somebody had to be handed the meanie ball. Yeah. And I'm not saying that Brainiac is not acting unstable, because he clearly is. Yeah. He's he's broken into uh uh, uh. since her since her girl's uh dorm yeah, that's room. not that's that's not good no you no can't. it's not actually does he do that in this issue or is that the next, issue, that when, next issue yeah in the next yeah. issue he breaks in uh they yeah. so the there are a couple of other things so the end result is hey we are not going to destroy the planet but we are going to take apart their engines so they can't go mm-hmm. anywhere right but Which is cool um okay so hmm what if this what if this thing that is powering your engines is also powering your life support and your food production you know if if, oh, if yeah. we ripped out if we ripped out a uh uh you know the the light speed engine inside of a star trek thing i'm all on my star trek game tonight people yeah you you are yeah if you ripped out the core Mm-hmm. The spaceship's going to have a few hours of life support, but after that, if they don't have those engines repaired, everybody on the Enterprise is dead. And so I kind of feel like when they're just like, yep, we're just going to yank out the, the engines and that'll take care of that, or the the power supply for the engines. It's kind of like, uh, there's probably some secondary uh, some secondary things that those, uh, that those power engines do or those uh, turbines do. But whatever, for the sake of let's not get into too complex of a discussion of right and wrong here and just assume that the legion always does everything correctly um let us then look at dawn star and how she is able to pick up people's scent that is a weird turn of phrase i mean that is a weird turn of phrase. i don't think she literally smells people i, I, I don't know i mean like it's a- very weird right yeah it's it's weird i just I read that and I was like, oh boy, that is stepping into some territory I don't want to go into. Well, you know, I don't know if you look at Larocque's Ultra Boy, but Larocque's Ultra Boy is a big rough neck and maybe yeah. he hasn't showered in a while. He might, you know, they, she might be following Ultra Boy Zach's body spray. I mean, in between switching between his, uh, his powers, maybe he's yeah. also turning on his super, super body odor. That's You're one right, of his, his other super, powers that have, super, to this point, has gone much. unnoticed. And they're just bringing this up now so that Don Star can smell yep. his super scent. He, yeah, yeah, he that's it. Ultra power. boy, He's, ultra boy yep. is a middle school kid who doesn't like to shower after gym. I don't know why I would know anything about that. Says the guy who has I a middle either. school kid who won't shower after gym. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. There's just like, a uh, there yeah. is one other thing that I thought, or maybe there's a couple of other things. Uh, mm-hmm. Sun boy, very much a cad. Putting the moves on Gigi. Ooh. Yeah, and then she basically uh, says, hey, well, let's not. Th- so uh, Sun boy, a cad. Gigi, not innocent in this because she's like, well, what about so-and-so? And he's like, well, she's not here, is she? And she's like, ooh, okay, then. He's like, well, we're, we're not, you know, we're not exclusive. I'm like, that's fine. Yeah. And. I, you know, the sun boy becoming a ladies man and then becoming a full on, you know, pickup artist bothered me in the eighties. But at this point in time, it kind of feels like in some ways it's the closest thing he has to a personality. (laughs) I mean, sun boy, do you remember when sun boy was legion leader? Sun boy, the cat is his personality. I, I can see that. I think the sun boy was Legion leader once and things nearly went to hell. And I feel yeah. like he has made himself the fun guy. He's the hedonist. If you, if you give him a fight, he will light things on fire. He will fight. He will burn people for you. He will go out. The Legion of supervillains is on the rampage. He will put the heat on them, but literally speaking, but I don't think that there's a whole lot more to him. I feel like he's just kind of a simple guy. You know, he likes, Kono juice and pretty girls and beaten up squares. And when it comes down to it, it's, it's not a good personality, but it's at least an interesting personality sometimes. And so I feel like it's better than what we keep giving shadow last, which is snotty blue girl who says mean things behind people's back. So, 
We also get a little short story, uh, Night of Madness, which is a total yawn fest for me. It is just oh, uh, so softcore. Sweet. It is is softcore porn for twelve year old boys uh, because it's you just have son. panel. You have panel after panel of uh, Dream Girl undressing, uh, mm -hmm. being uh, basically exposed in multiple panels. A, a definitely a Greg Land future and Greg Land inspired face on at least one panel. Uh, and that goes on for one, two and a half pages of the, of this little backup. And then they go and follow a guy and it turns out to just be a Halloween party gag. I don't mind the sisters teaming up and doing, you know, sisters, sisters, we are awesome sisters. I don't mind any of that. The whole storyline though is just dumb. It's kind of silly. Uh, the reason you get those faces is because this is Giffen breakdowns and Giffen, as you may remember, is in, in a transition period between crazy wacky go nuts and his super square area. But the art, the inking is done by Mike DiCarlo and Mike DiCarlo, you may remember, uh, is somebody who with his brother, Dan DiCarlo started out at Archie comics. Mm -hmm. So I've really, again, you know, we had Ernie Cologne transitioning over and I really kind of appreciate the Giffen and and uh, and uh, Frassam and Hassam and Carla Giffen and Carla art. I do agree with you that the whole dream girl gets naked and passes out, and her sister picks her up is just way too long. That's like three pages. But the upshot of it is, you have these two sisters who are nothing alike, and the Legionnaires are going to go have some fun and. You know, as the backup stories go, it's relatively silly. It's relatively harmless, and it does. I think does I would have, I think I would have rather fight. had. I think I would have rather had a couple more pages of fight scenes on on tier, or at least a greater conversation about what is going on with Brainiac Five as he stands at the hollow projection of Sensor Girl. Uh, right, yeah, uh, and I, I think I would have rather had maybe a little bit more of Sun Boy and Gigi besides just the one page. Um, I think I would have rather had those than, than this. I'm not saying that a sister adventure isn't fun. I'm not saying that the art isn't fun. I'm just saying it's mm -hmm. a story that ultimately does nothing except, Hey kids. And maybe that's the point too. Hey kids, can you figure out which Legionnaire is in the costume? I bet you can't. Um, <laughs> and then, and then trying to figure out, wait a minute, is that bouncing boy as Spock? No, it can't be him because bouncing boy is a giant round beat. Or whatever he is, a fruit of the loom guy. I think he's so a tomato. I, I guess I don't know. I just thought it. I just thought that this was really kind of a waste it's of, a silly, of space. It's a silly throwaway, but I also kind of wonder if the what feels to me like the quick departure of Steve Lytle as primary penciler might have had something to do with the backups because there was a backup last issue too. Yeah, and there's a backup in the next kind of issue like, as well. I wonder if maybe, hey, we well, needed to get Laurent quickly, and he wasn't, you know, we weren't up to getting a whole issue, so we had two teams working on two stories. So I don't part know. of the part of it is that this is the dollar fifty comics, uh, right? This is the mm -hmm. the bigger comic with the bigger page count. The Legion of Superheroes was one of the bigger sellers after the DC implosion. Certainly, we're moving into the era of of post crisis, even though crisis is still going on. And so this expectation that we have a main story and a backup, which I don't I don't genuinely have a problem with a main story and a backup. DC Comics did that most recently four or five years ago as, as a main thing, as they tried to bump up their page count. Yeah, they tried to bump up their uh, page count. And I and I really liked uh, many of those backup stories to create a way to draw people to specific comics. But I think that those backup stories, which is, I think, one of your complaints about these kind of things is they have to have substance if you expect people to pay more for those backup stories. And this is one of those times where I would feel cheated where the backup story wasn't quite there. I can see that. Yeah. Anything else you want to say on this issue? There is an interesting moment where Brainiac five is being all like, Oh, I'm Brainiac five. You guys, and he starts talking about, oh, Legionnaires wearing masks. And they mentioned that Dream Girl and Supergirl, Supergirl, both wore masks as mm -hmm. Legionnaires, which is true. Mm -hmm. This happened about mm -hmm. a year apart in 65. Yeah. 
Yeah. Supergirl was unknown boy. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, dream girl actually joined the team as mysterious. What a terrible name. Uh, in adventure comics, number three fifty, before becoming a full fledged member, uh, Mm -hmm. when Starboy returned. So Mm. I think, uh, I think uh, Brainiac may have some projection issues uh, in 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 his accusations. See, so I right. feel like you are you're just mad at Brainiac, and you're you're agreeing with Lightning Lass because you're mad at Brainiac. You're like Brainiac should do better. <laughs> I uh, I wish yeah, Brainiac. We'll, was we'll, we'll we'll find out. We'll find out. If you enjoy the show, we would appreciate your support. You can find out more and become a Legion Clubhouse member at patreon.com slash major spoilers. Legion of Superheroes, Volume 3, Number 21. Published April 1986. Obsession. Written by Paul Levitz with art by Greg LaRoque and Larry Malstedt. Synopsis. The return of the Emerald Empress means an all-new Fatal Five. And Training Session, written by Paul Levitz with art by Paris Cullens and Gary Martin. Will new Legionnaire Quizlet change Wildfire's life forever? Of course, we have one more issue to get through this week, and we need to go and see what is going on with Obsession, you know, the uh, from Coco Chanel. A very popular, popular concept in the 1980s, this obsession that we have with everything. And we start to see... Brainiac's obsession start to get a little maybe out of hand here because uh, he is convinced with Element Lad that uh, something as sneaky is going on with the sensor girl and he aims to find out. I also find it interesting that um, the costume changes that they decide to use here and we also see an evolution of and to me this is um, not quite five years later but definitely transitioning into that post-crisis look that we see a lot of the Legionnaires take on where suddenly Brainiac has this very Don Johnson haircut and he's wearing a trench coat. In fact, everybody's wearing a trench coat in the 1980s, but the super long hair and and his, in fact, Brainiac's chin, he gets a lot more beefier in his face. And then it's just like, well, I'm just going to wear this uh, overcoat. And so is uh, element lad. And we will go have an incognito discussion. Incognito for Brainiac five. The, the smartest man in the world consists of throwing that coat on over his regular purple speed suit and green skin. Yeah. And I feel like the number of green people on earth is probably not insignificant, but certainly not high enough to hide a man in a purple coverall and yellow boots. I mean, that is very clearly Brainiac five. Yeah. And then here's the other thing that is somewhat of, uh, an issue, I guess, because, Technically, the let's uh, save all of the criminals from Tachyon Galtos uh, happened Mm -hmm. two issues ago. And supposedly they all got on the on the the prison ship without a a problem. But the way that we lead into this mutiny on the ship where suddenly all of the prisoners are out feels like this is a continuation of the Tachyon Galtos. We've got them on the ship. Now we have to get them into their cages And of course, that's problematic because most of the Legionnaires that are here are the ones who were just involved in the uh, uh, Tyraxian death planet issue. And then there's some weird. Also, there's also, in addition to those characters, Matthew, we also Mm -hmm. have uh, the appearance of uh, of uh, Kurt uh, from the X-Men pops up in here, too. But he's not blue and he's not saying bam. Oh, uh, okay. You know who I'm talking about? Uh, uh, Nightcrawler from the X-Men? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nightcrawler from the Wait, X-Men is in this issue, but he's not blue. Wait. Uh, the, first page that we, the, the first page that we see uh, of the battle going on on, on the ship where Lightning Lass is, is telling uh, Sun Guy to, uh, to back down. Sun Emperor, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, do so you I'll not see him standing there. right next to Lightning Lass? I don't. You don't see you don't see uh, a timber wolf with his pointy ears and his super skinny body mm. looking exactly. Uh, the only thing that is missing is a tail on him. And this would Dude. be this would be Nightcrawler. 
I don't see it. This, uh, it's actually really bad anatomy, actually, too, in this. But no, it's that's totally Nightcrawler. From the it's hair and the ears weird. and the and the chin, that's Nightcrawler. <laughs> and then they fight. And then they fight, and uh, that's okay too. Uh, but again, uh, I will reiterate something that I've said multiple times. This is the swan song for many of these pre-crisis villains to get them to amp up their powers just a little bit more. And we see uh, Emerald, Emerald Empress uh, show up and she's got her powers are somewhat amped up here. And so we are setting everybody up for post-crisis. These are not the villains that you you thought you knew. These guys are bigger and badder than ever before. Everything you know is wrong. Yeah. Except for the fact that Titania of the Legion of Super Assassins is bigger and dumber even than Timberwolf. <laughs> and those are the ones that are fighting. Yeah, and that's the thing. She's just dumb enough for him to feel smart. Yeah. We actually have a moment in this issue where she says something so dumb and the Legion is like, oh my God, this is so dumb. When, Lightning Glass is like, I agree with Timberwolf. Yeah. When did Stompa... Do you know how serious it is? When, when did Stompa get introduced into the DC Comics? Stompa? Uh, Stompa is a Jack Kirby creation from... Yeah, fourth I can't world. remember if it was in the New Gods or in Mr. Yeah, Miracle. Well, it'd probably be one of those two, but it would, so it definitely, she was introduced in the 70s and not later in the 80s. Right. Okay. I, but, I just feel like, I just I feel like. It dates back to 1977 or 78. She's one of the people from Block's Homeworld. Yeah. I just feel They're like she is very perfect. much Stompa in her attitude. You know, he's going to smash you hard, puny nightcrawler man. That's, that's how I feel like she is, is kind of dumbing her down. She kind of is like Stompa. Dumb. Yeah. Uh, speaking of some, some other dumb things. Mm -hmm. This is the issue where Brainiac busts into Sensor Girl's uh, uh, apartment yes. or, you know, college dorm, Her whatever board. it is that they're calling these things. And he discovers a couple of things. First, a globe that is projecting what? something on the inside that he can't quite see. And it's then there's a flight ring. Planet. Well, it's some other planet that you can't make out. I wonder what it is. He thinks it's Krypton. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, Sensor Girl is not wearing her flight ring, and yet Sensor Girl flies into the room and disappears instantly, you know, like a speeding bullet. And so Brainiac is convinced that this is Supergirl come back mm -hmm. to, uh, I don't know, torment him, to re rekindle their romance that. that they never had. Well, they did. They just never really followed all the way through. And when she catches him, it's important. She turns off his vision. Yeah. She keeps him from being able to see and then dumps him back in the hallway. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty super, girl. I wonder. It's, but. I don't know. I just, I, I just, you know, when if, if we're going through this old home week, right, with all the villains, mm -hmm. it, it, and we saw a bouncing boy in last issue. Right. It's almost like we probably need to see some of the heroes who we haven't seen in a while. People whose worlds, you know, not just Krypton that isn't around, but other worlds that may or may not still be around or people have gotten misplaced or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think Sensor Girl, Matthew, mm -hmm. is really Tyrock. I'm not I think it's really, I think he's really Tyrock. Hey, who on, on the page where uh shadow Lass and, uh, who is the other one? Uh, Phantom girl are having their conversation. Mm -hmm. Who's is, who's the artist on that? Cause this is, this is a page that is radically different from a lot of the other art that we see in this issue. It, it really feels like someone else is not only arting up the page, but inking up the page. It's definitely Larock. If you look at the the men's jawlines, mm -hmm. oh, the jutting jaw, um, the jutting. Yeah, jaw. but yeah. I think it may be another Mike DiCarlo thing. Mm. I can't really tell because Malstead is Larry Malstead, who is the usual finisher on Greg Larock, is doing part of the issue, 
and also um bibbity bibbity i just literally said his name what's wrong carlo and i think what that may be is laroc with de carlo inks because remember mm. you pointed out strange eyes last issue yeah and i feel like that shadow last face with those really really big mm-hmm. eyes yeah feels like a mike de carlo face yeah it's just a very different art it it feels like a oh uh whoever's doing right now doing the art on um uh what is it luca kentner uh, the art style kind of reminds me of that also kind of reminds me of maybe some classic eerie comics maybe and that's may just be more in the way of the shading and the detail but a lot of the stuff yeah. on this page feels like it doesn't belong i mean i'm not saying it doesn't belong because it's legionnaires on another planet and of course none of that stuff makes right. any sense uh but what i'm saying is it just it is art that is not consistent with the rest of the issue I think that it's just a different anchor because when you come back to uh, the couples on the asteroid later, we do get another close up of Phantom Girl's face that are very clearly Mike DiCarlo eyes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, what we're looking at here is just the difference between Malstat inking and DiCarlo inking. Because it, if you look at Monel's face and Ultra Boy, especially. Because LaRock's Ultra Boy is this big, thick, rough neck with a big, broad jaw and a yeah. baggy haircut. I feel like, yeah, it's just different inking, but you're right. It is pretty distinct. And then yeah, we cut just, from that right back yeah. to the the Censor Girl Emerald Empress fight, and that mm-hmm. is very clearly LaRock and Malstad. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, one of the things that is revealed while they're out on their romantic couples get away is that mon L's lead serum is starting to wear off. He's becoming immune to his, mm-hmm. to his stuff. He, and mm, this is an example of why didn't you show not tell because they're like, Oh yeah, it's already gone from 48 hours to 25. We've seen no hint of that. We no, haven't even because... seen oh, mon L has a weird secret. <laughs> No, I mean, I don't, and I don't think, I don't think that, I don't think this is an instance where you have to show unless you are doing a thing where you're on the uh, medical satellite and Dr. Jim is like, oh, back again. Okay, boy, here, let me stick it up to you and make sure you fill out my credit report. You know, unless you're doing something like that, which really calls it out. I don't think that you having to up a dosage is something that you need to show in this case. However, it's pretty serious, though. If we've yeah, if yeah, we've yeah, yeah, craft is effectiveness. I feel like this is not the way to introduce that. Yeah, okay, but let's look at it a different way. Now, certainly, uh, this scene does not pass the Becknell test, but what you are seeing is Shadow Lass and Phantom Girl getting closer together because they are sharing uh, secrets with one another. And so right. while they, while the secrets they are sharing are, are about a guy. And so again, fails the Beck note test. Um, they mm. are showing that these two have a trusting relationship with one another, uh, that they right. are close with one another, not in a romantic way, but as, you know, as friends way. And so I think right. that the fact that, uh, shadow Lass reveals that and is making herself vulnerable to, uh, someone of the team that could, bring that up or cause problems. I think that's a, that shows some trust and some friendship between these two that Mm -hmm. I think does a lot more than just at this point saying, Oh, by the way, my boyfriend's uh, uh, drugs that he's taken are starting to wear off on him. That's, that's just me. And I understand where you're coming from too. Yeah. I feel like having mono like trying to hide something or having it be something where, Monel is is worried about something, or we interrupt conversations where we're like, "Oh, something's going on." This doesn't feel. This feels like a big reveal that hasn't really been built up, and I would have liked to see some build up. But and I, I wonder, agree with you. I really like their friendship. As you know, our men are best friends, and now we spend all of our time hanging out together. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I, I also wonder if that isn't part of the plot too, where it's like. Hey reader, we're going to tip you off that Monel's lead serum isn't working anymore. And you know, unless they're a longtime reader, the fact that Monel is allergic to lead really hasn't been brought up, or that he's on any kind of serum. So this also kind of serves mm-hmm. as that. Oh, by the way, kids, here's a reminder: 
that Monel is deathly allergic to serum, and if he doesn't uh, take it, he has to go back to the Phantom Zone until they can find a cure. Right. That plants the seed so that now you can start showing the effects of that, and the reader isn't sitting there scratching, well, why is Monel acting this way? Kind of thing. Um, only to reveal. Yeah, only to reveal later that Monel needs his medicine, in which all these new readers that are coming on board are suddenly like, I didn't even know anything like this was going on. So that may be the other reason why to bring it up uh, in this way. Mm -hmm. And then uh, finally, the issue wraps up with Sensor Girl, you know, flying across the galaxy to the Tachyon Galtus uh, ship and taking down the Emerald Empress uh, with a blink of an eye. It's like the Emerald em Empress uh, tells the uh, evil eye, the uh, Emerald Eye to strike down Sensor Girl and it projects something and then it just its projector fails. And so Sensor Girl is just like, I will take you down with my super breath or my giant slap across the face, uh, yes. which may or may not okay. be. Uh, I don't know. Where, where, where do you think Supergirl or I'm sorry, Sensor Girl learned uh, to slap like that? Do you think that she learned that from Superboy or did she learn some kind of a really cool martial arts or something to learn how to control her, her power so that she's not killing the Emerald Empress outright? Probably the Hank Pym school of backhand slapping. Oh, yeah, yeah, that too, right? But, I mean, her, her strike is important because it's the Emerald Empress saying, join the Fatal Five, you have no reason to be a legionnaire, and just, pow, you offend me. I'm like, yeah. oh, oh, this is somebody who has no problem smacking down royalty. It's almost as though she is yeah, possibly... royal on... Her royal on... Uh, uh, royal. I, so here's here's something without without giving too much away, dear ladies and gentlemen. Um, thirty five year old spoilers. Yeah, thirty five year old spoilers. If it's if this does play out as Brainiac thinks uh, that this is Supergirl, he's convinced that it's Supergirl by the end of the issue. By the way, mm -hmm. this globe that he has in Sensor Girl's uh, apartment shows some vision of some place that he assumes is the planet Krypton. Do you think that Supergirl would have Krypton as her projection, or would she have Argo City? It's an interesting question. Because she almost, if I'm not mistaken, she also spent a great deal of time on Argo, maybe not in this continuity, maybe I'm thinking post-crisis continuity, but she spent a great deal of time on Argo City watching uh, Krypton blow up. So she was not really part of Krypton. She was a part of something different. Hmm. I mean, she, Argo City is a city on Krypton, and it yeah. left Krypton right uh, during the explosion. So right. I, at this, and point, then she spent a long like, time yeah. on Argo City, right? Which is Kryptonian. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, it, are we trying to poke holes in Brainiac's theory? I, I am a little bit. I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah. With Supergirl, would she would she have Argo? You know, the bubble city of Argo, Argo City, floating in space. Would that would be mm -hmm. what she would have in her snow globe, or would she have the planet Krypton in her snow globe? Uh, she would almost certainly have her sled. <laughs> she would have crypto and, and streaky and uh, yeah. a horse that used to be a man, but then wanted to be a horse. And then things got really weird. No, he was a man. He was then a centaur. No, he was a centaur who wanted to be a horse. Oh, no. Okay. So wait, he was a horse for, okay. Uh, Comet. We'll just call him Comet. Yeah. And then we get a backup Don't story. We get a backup yeah. story where Quizlet and Wildfire are training with one another and Quizlet's just weird and turns into Astro Boy. And <laughs> I'm like, okay. This is the first real demonstration of Quizlet's powers. We've yeah. seen him doing things, but this is the point where they're like, okay, this is what he does. And this is, you know, the basics of it. He's not just a little Starship Enterprise floating around, but... He does also uh, set up something here because this is the beginning of the weirdest Legion friendship, and that is the buddy relationship between Quizlet and Wildfire. Or to put it in acting terms, the buddy relationship between Will Smith and Wally Cox. I was going to say this is more like the relationship between the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. 
<laughs> now, Wildfire eventually does kind of get Quizlet's uh, number, and they actually do have something akin to a friendship uh, later on in the game. But it is interesting to see this here and to see Quizlet being silly and intentionally pranking Wildfire yeah. because Wildfire is known for losing his cool, literally, because right. he's a nuclear furnace. Right. But I, I do like the fact that you have the guy who's known for freaking out and screaming, and you've teamed him up with the guy who likes to poke at people. Mm-hmm. Let's have fun today. Hooray. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there there you go. Uh, that That's that one. I didn't really care for it, but whatever. I liked it because it gives us the really weird Greg LaRock bubble helmet. Yeah. That wraps it up for this installment of the Legion Clubhouse. Matthew, what did we learn this week? We learned that Rimbor isn't yet the armpit of the galaxy, the way Ultra Boy smack talking tears planet. I think we also learned that combining matter and antimatter is not a good idea. Oh, wait, that's a Star Trek le- lesson. Never mind. That's a Star Trek, yeah. Never mind. And we learned that Element Lad joined the Legion as Mystery Lad way back in Adventure Comics number 307 in 1964. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this week on the Legion Clubhouse. Hey, look, we can't do the show without support from our fine listeners like you. So we're down a couple of hundred dollars from where we're normally supposed to be uh, this time of the year. So if you enjoy the show and you want it to continue through 2024, I'm going to ask um, uh, you to head over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash major spoilers. And if you sign up at the $5 level, that's the silver dollar level, the uh, uh, $5 a month membership, then uh, everybody who does that and in your sign-up note uh, just says something about Long Live the Legion or uh, Eat It Grandpa, I will re- start reading your names in this segment of, of the show or even at the top of the show. So if you want to get kind of a, a uh, semi-shout-out uh, in the show, then most definitely head to patreon.com slash major spoilers at the silver level or higher. Use the phrase Long Live the Legion or Eat It Grandpa. And uh, I will I will announce your name uh, right here on this show. Patreon.com slash major spoilers. So until next time, I'm not beyond asking for money, man. And I'm Psychoanalysis Lit. The Legion Clubhouse is a production of Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC, and is produced by Steven Schleicher. Your hosts were Matthew Peterson and Steven Schleicher. You can follow Matthew at Mighty King Cobra and Stephen at Major Spoilers. You can follow this podcast on Twitter at Legion Clubhouse. If you have questions or comments, send them to podcast at Majorspoilers.com. I'm Jason Inman. Until next time, eat it, Grandpa. This podcast is copyright 2024 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.